Welcome to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Adam Cronin, and today we're discussing the future of capital gains taxes. That means we'll get into why the Biden administration is proposing to raise capital gains taxes right now, how that's likely to affect the economy, and what the arguments are both for and against this proposal. Let's start with why the Biden administration is proposing to raise the capital gains tax in the first place. And there's really a short-term answer, a medium-term answer, and a long-term answer to this question. In the short term, it is simply to help pay for the American Families Plan, which is the infrastructure program that the Biden administration has laid out. And they plan to spend something like $1.8 trillion for care infrastructure. That means child care and education programs. Also potentially for health care, which would mean lowering the Medicare eligibility age. Also expanding Medicare benefits to include things like hearing, vision, dental, and to put a cap on out-of-pocket medical expenses. There's also some climate change incentives is part of this proposal. And so this is a way to help fund this infrastructure plan in the short term. In the medium term, this is a way to help stave off the potential devaluation of the U.S. dollar. And there's a few macroeconomic trends we need to consider to understand why the U.S. dollar is at risk of being devalued. The first is that the federal debt has never been higher for the U.S. The U.S. government now owes more than an entire year's worth of GDP as debt. This is the largest debt that the U.S. government has ever held. It's also the largest debt that any country has ever held in the history of the world. And the second thing is, in order to pay off this debt, the U.S. has been printing tons of money. It's not exactly printing because most of it is created digitally, but printing is a good way to think about it. And one metric I saw is that 22% of all U.S. dollars ever created were created in the year 2020. And this makes it easier for the U.S. to pay off its debts. You just print more money, you pay off debts, and it's less wealth that you have to actually give over because you're devaluing the dollar with every new dollar that you add into the monetary supply. At the same time, as all this debt is ballooning, as the dollar is potentially becoming devalued from all this money printing, the Biden administration feels the need to spend even more money in order to stimulate the economy to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. And there are good reasons why the Biden administration feels the need to inject yet another stimulus. We already had multiple stimulus checks go out in the past year, but there is still a looming eviction crisis. There is still more unemployment than we would like to see. And there are still many Americans who are struggling to get by. So if you put yourself in Biden's shoes for a minute, There needs to be some counterbalance to all of this spending that's going to be needed, to all of this money printing, and to all of this debt, or you risk the collapse of the U.S. dollar. Where are you going to get more revenue from? The only place that seems to be politically favorable is to get it from the wealthy, from the top 1%. And this may be a better proposal than Warren's wealth tax proposal because taxing based on income is fairly standard practice. Whereas taxing based on someone's net worth, which would be a wealth tax, is much more nebulous and that could lead to many more areas for loopholes. So by only taxing people who earn over $1 million a year at a higher marginal capital gains tax rate, you may be able to counteract some of these negative effects from all of the spending. The long-term answer to the question of why we might want to implement a higher capital gains tax rate right now is to reduce inequality over time. And when you look back at the past 30 years, the top 1% of US households have seen their wealth rise from something like 33% to 40% of all US wealth, just in the top 1%. Whereas the bottom 90% have seen their wealth decline from 33% in the 1980s to just 20% today. So due to this compounding effects of the wealthy getting wealthier and wealthier over time, especially with investment returns, your wealth tends to build on itself. And when we consider other trends like artificial intelligence, automation, globalization, it seems like inequality will only get worse and worse over time unless we do something to counteract these forces. And it's become particularly poignant since the COVID-19 pandemic started. Since COVID began, we've seen a K-shaped recovery where the investor class has seen tremendous gains since COVID began. 
And normal people who just hold their money either in a savings account or in a 401k have not done well at all. They've seen their wealth evaporate to a large extent. And history shows that anytime inequality gets too great, it leads to revolution, civil war, a war between countries. This has been shown time and time again, and we'll get more into the historic cycles of events towards the end of the episode. Now let's get into some arguments against raising the capital gains tax rate. The main arguments against raising the capital gains tax rate is that it will kill innovation. A higher marginal tax rate means a lower return on investment. Therefore, by increasing the capital gains tax, you are disincentivizing investment. And when people invest in new startups, in new companies, in new wild ideas, that's what ends up creating jobs down the road. And there's a reason that historically we have tax capital gains lower than income tax because we want to incentivize that innovation. And really, that's one of the best things going for the U.S. economy right now is all of those new startups, those new business ventures, Silicon Valley, the stock market. These are the strengths of America. So we don't want to limit our strengths. And raising the capital gains tax may be limiting the best thing going for America right now. There's a tweet from Tim Draper where he highlights this. He says, 43.4% capital gains tax might kill the golden goose that is America in Silicon Valley. People need an incentive to build long-term startups of value. In California, that would be a 56.4% tax burden and more than 50% spells death to job creation. So Tim Draper brings up a good point, which is that a lot of investment happens in Silicon Valley And it's not like any one investor owns 100% of the company. This is split between many individuals. So if you spend years working on a startup and then finally it gets acquired, it gets sold, you have some sort of liquidation event, you could be giving over more than half of your gains to the government. And that may disincentivize new innovation and new startup investments down the road. Another argument against raising the capital gains tax rate, and really for the capital gains tax existing at all, is that that income has already been taxed. So now you have a situation where you are allowing double taxation for citizens. And if you include inflation, then it could be considered triple taxation. Here's one tweet from someone who said, LMAO, it's basically triple taxation. One, tax on earned income. Two, tax on capital gains from how you invest that earned income. Three, inflation. So this is a good point because if I work hard at my job and I earn a living, then I get taxed on that income, right? I only can use the after-tax income as my discretionary income to do with what I will. And if I decide to take a long-term approach to build wealth for myself and my family over time, so I invest my after-tax income in the stock market, then I'm getting taxed again once I realize the gains from those investments. And if all the while the government is printing money, then that is yet another version of taxation because my wealth dwindles the more money that is printed. Another argument I've heard against raising the capital gains tax rate is that, hey, I'm okay paying a higher capital gains tax rate so long as the product I'm paying for is good. And if you think of America as a product, like think about it as a subscription fee and you subscribe to America and you get the benefits of what it means to be an American citizen, it's worth considering what are those benefits? What do we actually get in exchange for our tax dollars? And what will we get additionally for these additional tax dollars if this proposal is passed? The infrastructure plan may look great on paper. Education is important. Child care is important. Infrastructure is important. But the actuality of how that gets implemented by the government may be a total mess. It may end up being another case of wasteful government spending. There are a lot of countries that have a capital gains tax rate as high as what is being proposed or even higher, but these countries also have things like universal health care, something that America doesn't have. And America spends more on health care than almost any other countries, and yet we have worst health outcomes, we have higher premiums for individuals, and overall the system is a mess. It's really hard to be able to get quality medical care without being an expert in the space. Similarly, with military spending, there is so much inefficiency. The U.S. currently spends over $700 billion per year on the military. And without doubt, much of this could be repurposed not only to other things that are important, like healthcare and infrastructure, 
but also just to smarter ways of spending the military budget itself. So critics who take this line of reasoning would say, hey, the government should use the tax dollars it collects right now more wisely rather than just continuing to ask for more tax dollars. We have a huge budget as it is. Let's try to use our current budget more wisely before asking more from individuals. The final argument that I'll mention against raising the capital gains tax rate is the classic slippery slope argument that this is only the beginning. And once we allow this tax proposal to pass, there will be many more tax increase proposals that will be passed in the future. This is best distilled by a tweet from Naval Ravikant, where he says, the road to socialism via inflation. One, print money, crash the reserve currency, destroy savers, and force them into inflated assets. Two, asset inflation leads to inequality, demonize asset holders, and tax the nominal gains, thereby confiscating the real value of the assets. And the real danger of socialism in my mind are not the great social programs like healthcare, Medicare, universal basic income. Those can all be done within a capitalistic context. The real danger is this zero sum mentality where you start to demonize people that have a lot of wealth. You start to focus more on taking other people's wealth rather than us all trying to create new wealth. And this is the danger that Naval is getting at. There are definitely counters to this argument. And I think the slippery slope argument normally doesn't stand the test of time because anytime there's a trend, there's a counter trend. It's like in art. Anytime there is some new cool thing in art, you can be damn sure the next trend is going to be the opposite of that or some deviation from what is currently trendy. So I don't think this is as big of a concern, but we're going to get more into that potentiality once we discuss the worst case scenario. Now let's discuss some of the rebuttals that proponents of this increase to the capital gains tax would say to the critics. I'll open with a tweet from Robert Reich. He says, pay no attention to the wailing you're hearing from the street. Biden's upcoming proposal to raise capital gains taxes on those earning $1 million plus would affect only the richest 0.32% of Americans whose capital gains, mostly shares of stock, have soared over the last decade. This is a really important point, and that is that Biden is proposing to only increase capital gains taxes for people who earn over a million dollars a year. So for 99.97% of Americans, this will have no effect. Now, I will say that the reason there has been such an enormous response to this proposal is that so many Americans think they're going to be millionaires. That is part of the American ethos, especially when you think about Robin Hood traders, Wall Street bets traders, all of these new investors, many people feel like they will one day be millionaires and therefore they don't want to do something that would hurt them once they are a millionaire down the road. That, I think, is the reason why we saw the market drop after the announcement of this proposed increase to the marginal capital gains tax rate. The second rebuttal, which is also very important and valid, is that historically, this new capital gains tax rate isn't even that high. When you look at the past capital gains tax rates that we've had for the highest income bracket, we had a higher tax rate in the 1950s, in the 1960s, in the 1970s, and in the 1980s. So it's really only since the 1990s that we've had a lower capital gains tax rate than what's being proposed. Now, I will say, since the 1990s, that's when we really had the dot-com boom. We had Silicon Valley became Silicon Valley. A lot of the FANG companies were started during this time when we had a low capital gains tax rate. So there is a very real possibility that a lower capital gains tax rate will increase innovation. But it's also hard to say that what's being proposed is a super high capital gains tax rate that the U.S. has never experienced in the past. That is simply not the case. We are more realistically returning the capital gains tax rate to what it more typically was throughout most of America's history. And when you look at the historic relationship between changes to the capital gains tax rate and changes to the stock market returns, there is no statistical correlation. There's a tweet from Liz Ann Saunders, and she tweets, virtually no relationship between changes in capital gains tax rate and S&P 500 returns in year of change. Last time cap games went up in 2013, S&P 500 had a stellar year, up 30%. 
and she shows a chart showing the lack of relationship between the capital gains tax rate and stock market returns. And the final argument that proponents of this bill would make is that it is dangerous to do nothing. We need to take steps to combat inequality, to stave off mass evictions that are looming on the horizon once the eviction ban is lifted. We're also staving off the collapse of the US dollar, which would be terrible. We are staving off a potential revolution or war due to massive inequality. So it's important to know where we are in the cycle, how important it is for us to take action right now, and the risk of doing nothing. That is also something we need to carefully consider. Now let's get into the future scenarios. Let's talk about the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. For the worst case scenario, I'm going to outline two different scenarios. One I call the Republican nightmare scenario and the other I call the Democratic nightmare scenario. The Republican nightmare scenario is that, yes, we passed this higher capital gains tax rate and that is a slippery slope to passing many more higher tax rates. And this leads to a scenario where we eventually become a socialist country. We take so much of the wealth that's created from individuals, from innovators, from makers, and we redistribute that to all the people that are just hanging on to the system. And so we're no longer incentivizing innovation. We become more like what Ayn Rand describes in her book, Atlas Shrugged, a zero-sum civilization that really only cares about redistributing things that people make rather than trying to make more things itself. The other scenario is the democratic nightmare where let's say the capital gains tax rate does not get passed. And let's say that Congress is not able to pass any meaningful legislation to reduce inequality. Over time, that could lead to a revolution. It could lead to people being in such dire straits that they rise up in arms against the government or the people of America fight amongst themselves or America becomes entangled with some foreign adversaries in a World War III type of scenario, this is obviously a terrible outcome. And history does show that anytime inequality gets too great, there is a very real risk of war, civil war, foreign wars, and massive upheaval. Now let's get into the best case scenario. Best case scenario. The best case scenario in my mind is that we don't go too far to either extreme. We probably will need to raise the capital gains tax rate to some degree, maybe not as extreme as what's being proposed right now, but oftentimes politicians ask for way more than they actually need. So once they negotiate, they land somewhere fairly reasonable. It is important for us to raise the revenue that the government collects so that we can stave off some of the massive inequality that has been taking place. And it's important that we do not kill the golden goose that is the American economy, the stock market, Silicon Valley, all of this innovation that takes place in the United States is so vital to our success in the future. And in the best case, not only do we have more resources with which to help people who are being left behind in our economy, but we become much more efficient with how we spend the federal budget in general. The things that are most important are the essentials, healthcare, housing, education. These things are vitally important. So in the best case, we're able to provide that for all of our citizens without stooping to a zero-sum mentality where we feel like we are at odds with one another. We should all realize we are part of the same team. We should take a positive-sum mentality where we're all trying to build wealth together. And at the same time, we shouldn't let those less fortunate fall beneath a certain level. We need some basic level of support for those less fortunate in our economy. Now let's get into the most likely scenario. Most likely scenario. For the most likely scenario, let's consider precisely where we are in the long-term debt cycle. And a great way to think about this is a mental model known as the four turnings. The four turnings is a model for understanding how history repeats itself. Every 80 years, the same cycle tends to occur. These 80-year cycles are known as cyclum because they are about the length of a human life. 
And many economists, many historians, many fiction writers talk about the cyclical nature of reality. Mark Twain said that history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. We see this portrayed in Lord of the Rings, in Beowulf, in so many stories, we see that the same mistakes that have been made in the past, they are made again once people no longer have memory of the prior mistakes. And imagine in olden times, a king would win some great war, he would establish his kingdom, and there would be good prosperous times for about the next 80 years during his life, maybe during the first few years of the life of his successor. But after then, people forget how hard the previous times were and they fall into the same patterns. They make the same mistakes and therefore the society crumbles, it gets restarted again, and the whole 80-year cycle starts all over again. And within each 80-year cycle, there are four turnings or four seasons. You can think of it like summer, spring, fall, and winter. The first turning is a high. So think of this as summer. The king has just established his kingdom. You just won the Great War. Or most recently, this is after World War II. America and the Allies defeated the Axis, and therefore things were really prosperous in America during the 1950s right after this time. This is when the greatest gener generation was alive, the generation that fought in World War II. This is when there was more equal wealth distribution than America has pretty much ever had. You could work at a gas station or work in a factory and still have the American dream of owning a home with a white picket fence. And a lot of Make America Great Again, what that slogan refers to is this time period of the last summer, the first turning that we had most recently. The second turning is an awakening. This is a passionate era, and you can think of it as spring. In the most recent turning for us, we had the 1960s civil rights movement. We had the Women's March. We had gay rights. We had Martin Luther King, JFK, the Beatles. We had psychedelic culture, where people started to realize there was more to life than just earning a living, and people wanted to self-actualize. This is also when the first Apple computer came out and there was the Think Different slogan. So this is a time period where there is almost a rediscovery of what's important in life. There's a lot of art, a lot of passion. The third turning, there is an unraveling. This is the fall time period. So things have been good for quite some time and they start to calcify during the third turning. It's also called the downcast era. And this is when Generation X was in its heyday. This is also when the WTF happened in 1971 becomes relevant because during this time period, Nixon took the U.S. off the gold standard. This is when inequality really started to rise. This is when we had the L.A. riots. We had an uptick in bombings and shootings. We had disillusionment from the hippie era. There was more of a sober realism. And there was also a bit of pessimism. This is when 9-11 happened. This is also when the wars in Afghanistan were started. There were lots of critics criticizing society, criticizing government policy. This is the third turning. And the fourth turning, unfortunately, is what we're in right now. This is the era of crisis, the era of upheaval. It is winter. This is when in Game of Thrones, they talk about winter is coming. This is the winter that is coming for some time. And all of a sudden you have this breakdown of society really being felt. And people are wondering what's going to happen next. What is the next era going to bring? Because the previous era that started was so long ago, it's hard to even imagine the world restarting in a new way. So in the most recent fourth turning we had, was the 2008 financial crisis. That was what started this last period of crisis. And it's supposed to go from 2008 until 2028. So we still have some time to go for this fourth turning to become fully realized. And the last fourth turning was the Great Depression in World War II. That was 80 years ago. 80 years before that, we had the Civil War. 80 years before that, we had the Revolutionary War. So you can see these cycles really do tend to repeat as people become forgetful of what prior generations have experienced. So in the most likely scenario, we will have to contend with this fourth turning. There's no way we can just wish that it weren't occurring. We have to deal with the time that's allotted to us in this life. And millennials, this is our era to take charge. We are essentially the greatest generation that won World War II for this fourth turning. 
And according to Ray Dalio, he does a phenomenal assessment of all of the cycles of history that he calls the long-term debt cycle and short-term debt cycle. And the only tools that he has seen work in bringing about the next summer, the next cycle of prosperity is to one, print money. We've already been doing a ton of that and it's the easiest solution because there's no one who's clearly against it. Kind of everyone takes a hit when you print money. And so this is something we've been doing for a while, but we're starting to reach the point where the returns of printing money may now be less than the dangers of printing more money. The second tool is to cut spending. We really should be cutting spending right now, but it makes sense that as we are still recovering from the COVID pandemic, we do need to help people out. We do need to stave off this eviction crisis. So it doesn't look like we'll be able to cut spending in the short term. But certainly when we're talking about the next 10 years, 15 years, we need to cut spending. We need more fiscal responsibility in our government. The third tool is to reduce debt. So this can be from defaulting on the debt the U.S. owes, which probably unlikely to happen, or it can be forgiving debt owed to others. For instance, all the student loan debt, we might just decide to forgive that debt one day. Or simply paying off our debts. Hey, let's get out of debt as America. Let's pay back all the money we owe so we can be a fiscally responsible country again. This is one of the trickiest solutions. And I think we're going to dabble in all of those areas, but it's unlikely this alone would solve the problem. The fourth tool for bringing about the next era of prosperity and getting through the fourth turning is to redistribute wealth, whether that's through giving people more benefits like more health care, giving things like universal basic income to people. So my most likely scenario is that we will implement some of all of these four solutions, cut spending, reduce debt, redistribute wealth, print money, in order to bring about the next cycle. And I feel confident we will bring about the next cycle. This is not the end of America. This may be the end of America as the sole hegemon of the world, but this is not the end of America's success, prosperity, and innovation. And both the democratic nightmare scenario and Republican nightmare scenario are worth worrying about. We shouldn't go too far in either extreme. But one point of optimism I would say is that never before in history has the world been as interconnected as it is right now. We've never had so much real-time information as we have today. So it's hard to imagine us undergoing as tumultuous of a fourth turning as we had in World War II or the Civil War or the Revolutionary War, simply because people know a lot more. Let's say the dollar all of a sudden experienced runaway inflation. Almost instantly, people would shift their wealth to other asset classes like gold or real estate or cryptocurrencies. And likewise, if there's some sort of war between countries, other countries are also involved and they will do their part to resolve the situation. Because of the global connectedness of the economy, if China takes a hit, the U.S. takes a hit. If the U.S. takes a hit, China takes a hit. So we are all interconnected with this way where we really want to do what is best for the grand collective of the entire global economy. So in short, I'm pretty optimistic about the future. We definitely have some challenging years ahead between now and about 2028. But personally, I bought the dip. I bought the Bitcoin dip, the stock dip. My thesis on the future of America is that we have a strong future in store for us. We're going to talk about what I think that's a good place to end it. Thank you for tuning in. And And I'll see you next time. The past, the present, and the future.